Welcome to speaking the truth in love, embracing the Jesus counterculture. And uh, today we are in week nine, week nine. So this is a 10 week class. We're in week nine. We've got one more after this. We've been going through the Ten Commandments. And uh, in going through the Ten Commandments, we are finding the Jesus counterculture. Surprise, surprise. And um, we've also been looking at a lot of first things. We've been looking into the, the very beginnings and how God created the world and how, uh, how it went bad. And finding, laced in there, all of our contemporary issues. And so really grounding the Jesus counterculture in truly what Jesus was grounded in, which is God's design. He was there to bring back the garden. And we will see that again today. Um, today, taking a look at the Eighth Commandment, and this is a, this is a big one. This, one, this one's kind of sneaky, and it'll, it'll, it'll get us in a pretty big way, I think, today. And, uh, and so let's begin with a prayer, and then we will have some, uh, some, table, some talk around the tables, and, um, and then we will, uh, we'll get to some teaching here. So let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, you are truth. You are the source of truth. You are the, the reason truth even exists. And uh, you, you give us that truth. Lord, we pray that we might receive your truth and tell the truth, even, even when it is not convenient or easy for us. Teach us how to be different uh, by being honest. Uh, we pray your blessings upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to open up with some conversation around the tables. Um, we are in the midst of a trust crisis in our country. Do you agree? Yes. 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 So I'm just kind of cracking the issue open with this one. Share a time recently when you heard some news. And by the way, this news could come from any source. All right. Usually when we think of news, we think of news outlets, media, things like that. It may not be that, okay? But you heard some news and instantly doubted it was true. Okay? And then just explore a little bit of how that felt. All right? So share your time recently when you heard some news and instantly doubted that it was true. And how did it make you feel? All right? Everybody, go. All right, let's bring it back together. How many of you found it really difficult to think of a time when you heard news and you doubted it? <laughs> you could talk about it for an hour, I'm sure. Um, and, and, I think, and I think there's a reason why, right? Because this is the world we live in now. And, and we have a trust crisis uh, 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 of what I would say epic proportions right now in our in our country and, and even around the world uh, which makes it a perfect time to talk about the eighth commandment so you see it on your sheet we're doing it confirmation style and say together the eighth commandment you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor all right and I want to talk a little bit about the power of our testimony the power of our testimony. I want you to think back. I'm not going to make you look there, but uh, you know we're going to Genesis anyway. But how did God create things? He spoke, right? He used words and real physical things came into existence. Okay? We can use words. Now, we can't use words to bring about physical things into existence. But we can use our words to bring things into existence in people's minds. Okay? So there was, there was an old kind of uh, fable-like thing that, you know, a, a, you know kind of a, a wife's tale of some sort about the boy who cried wolf. All right, and that was way, way, way back, right? And it's all about being dishonest. And the, and the boy who is out shepherding the sheep and, and would cry wolf, and everybody would come running. Well, what happened when he cried wolf? It was a reaction in the people. 
they believed in their mind that a wolf was really coming. And they believed it a couple of times, maybe three times. But finally, each time there was no wolf. So then when the boy saw the real wolf coming and cried out, wolf, nobody believed him. Right? And I think that's where we are right now in our country. Where people can say things, but... But so many times they have been proven to be false or dishonest in some sort of way that we look, we look at it all and we're like, sure, whatever, <laughs> prove it to me. What's your source? And I don't trust you anyway. I, I need to hear from somebody who's on my side. Right? Don't we do that? And... And I, and I think what it shows is just the power of our words, okay? The power of our words. We all have the ability to create a reality for other people using only our words, okay? And that reality can be whatever we want it to be. And in, in a lot of ways, that puts us in a God-like position in relationship to other people. Now, obviously, this becomes a problem when we start creating realities in people's minds that aren't true. Okay? Because the truth always wins in the end. Right? The truth always is going to eventually come out. It's eventually going to be shown whatever it is, this all wacky reality that you decided to put up before you, or maybe it's just some sort of protective reality, or maybe it's some, some preferred reality that you have, and whatever that is, is eventually going to break down. Okay? It's, it's just going to happen. All right? Um, but, but I really want us to acknowledge the power that we have. I don't think we realize I don't think we realize the power that we have to create a reality in other people's heads, okay? And it's not just lies versus truth. Um, I find it really interesting that, you know, if you, look at, if you look at the commandment, here's what it doesn't say. Don't lie to your neighbor. It doesn't say don't lie. It says don't give false testimony. Now, how many ways can you give a false testimony? Right? There are a lot of ways to give a false testimony, right? One way would be to lie, right? There is a truth, and I'm going to tell an untruth, intentionally, something that is the, the opposite of the truth. But is it always just a complete opposite of the truth? No. 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 Sometimes we'll do half-truths. Sometimes we'll kind of give them a little bit of the truth, and then the rest of it's kind of the way we would like it to be, okay? And... And, and sometimes that half-truth is really just a spin. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm going to tell you the thing that happened, but I'm also going to tell you how you should think about it and how you should feel about it and all of those. That's, that's an untruth too, right? Because how you, how you feel about it is something that you should be able to, to have, not necessarily something that's attached to the truth. Do you know what I'm saying? The truth is the truth one way or the other. A thing happens one way or another, right? And we should be able to decide how we feel about it based upon our values. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and so there are, there are many, many, many ways for us to present it. And there's also, a, this is also something that, that, uh, that comes to is when, when we've been fed lies and then we repeat them. Okay. And that's actually a big deal right now in our, in our culture, right? You hear about misinformation, disinformation, right? And, and the fight is over who's telling you the lie that you're propagating. And then, of course, we have to fight over who's telling the lies because nobody knows who's telling the truth anymore, okay? And so, and, but that's also a real thing for us too, right? We have to, have, to, have to be careful that when we repeat something that we're not repeating somebody else's lie which makes us all very tentative, right? Because you wanna, you, you wanna be able to talk about things that are going on in the world, 
But how do you know if you're even telling the truth yourself? So it puts us in this weird spot where we don't trust anyone. And then it gets into our relationships, right? And it's and it becomes a it becomes a very, very challenging thing for us to navigate. And I would say a lot of the challenges that we have in our world right now stem from this trust crisis that we're in. Because if we could if we could just eliminate that, if we could eliminate the trust crisis, we could actually have conversations. Right? And I could believe the things that are being told uh, without constantly doubting them. You know, and our relationships could be stronger. And we might even be able to work on something crazy called compromise, where we actually seek you know, the good for everybody and, and you know, instead of living in this sort of polarized world that we live in. All right, that's a lot to attach to the commandment. But, but I, I, I hope it all rings true to you and you can understand why we have an eighth commandment. Because we, we're living in a world where that's completely broken down. Okay. Well, I want to talk a little bit about where it came from. And then we're also going to discuss uh, the way to kind of live as the counterculture of it. Genesis 3 is where we're going to go. And, um, and if you've noticed, we've been living in Genesis maybe 2, 3, and 4 this whole class. That's because we have been. <laughs> It's just the way it has been. And, and it's interesting how the, you know, I keep being drawn back to these stories. Um, and, you, and you'll see it again here. So Genesis 3, verses 1 through 5 is where we are. Again, I'm in the ESV version, if it's different than your Bible. And, um, and I made reference to this in my sermon today. So now I get to take a look at the, uh, the crafty serpent. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit, fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. All right, so there's your serpent. And from the very beginning, lies. Later on, Jesus is going to refer to the devil as the father of lies, the originator of lies. And this is the first one. And it's interesting he, he tells a few lies here, uh, and some of them are, are different kinds of lies. So, for instance, um, the, the big one, verse 4, you will not surely die. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just read another chapter. Right? We're going to get all the way to that, and they're going to be killing each other. Right? That's, that is just an outright lie. Okay. On the face of it, just completely false. But he also gives us some half truths, right? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. True or false? True. 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 But notice, he's spinning it. He's spinning it as a good thing for you to know good and evil rather than something that will destroy all of civilization. <laughs> okay. So there's your first spin, just in case you thought it was a new thing. <laughs> right? It's not a new thing. It's not a new thing at all. It is, it is absolutely something that goes all the way back to the beginning. Tell a truth, but cast it in an opposite light. I see a hand over here. Yeah, what's your question? The first thing was when he opened up the door a little bit. The question. Sure. Sure, did God really say? Right? And that's and that's sort of setting the stage for it, right? Because his purpose is to convince her in her heart that that this is a good thing to do. And that's actually what we're gonna talk about next week. Um, but really kind of focusing in on the serpent, the the lie is that God, God isn't telling you the truth. Now think about that 
for a moment. The source of truth and the creator of all things is lying to you. What, what is there to trust then? Right? The only one you have to trust at that point is yourself. yourself which is what she did. She took matters into her own hands. Okay? And, and this is where we get to fast forward just a little bit into, uh, into the, the ramifications of all of this. And so look forward into uh, verse 8 through 13. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. All right. Well, Truth? Truth? <laughs> kind of? Right? I mean, not, neither of those are outright lies, are they? No. They're not. No. They're not outright lies. I mean, he could, have, he could have very easily have said, No, I don't know what you're talking about, God. Never mind the juice on my chin. <laughs> right? Or something like that. It just... <sighs> but he... But he's, well, he, he, he there's, a, there's a blame shifting, right? And so there's a, there's a truth. Hey, the woman you, you gave to me, she, she convinced me, and I, which is true. It was he who ate first. Okay. Now, does this absolve him of all responsibility? No. <laughs> because all he's trying to do is to use that truth to skirt himself from his own responsibility. Now, how often do we do that? How often do we try to spin the truth in a certain way? Yeah, I did it. Or maybe it was like, but it's really their fault. I am really the innocent. Well, I was, you know, I was forced to, I'm a victim, you know, all of that kind of thing. And that's, but don't we do that? Doesn't that, isn't that everywhere? It's everybody else's fault, but yours. Okay. And that, that's what makes it so shocking for some people when they show up in one of our worship services. And the first thing we're doing is saying, I'm guilty. I am so guilty, God. <laughs> Could you just find it in your heart to forgive me again? But let me tell you how healthy that is and how much truth is right there. Okay? The rest of the world's like, not my fault, not my fault. I'm a victim. Okay? And victimhood, I mean, absolutely there are people who are, who are victimized in our world. I don't want to minimize that. But often that's the excuse we use to get out of things that are actually our responsibility. Okay? So, once again, kind of a truth, but not really, okay? So now we, let's, let's fast forward to four, chapter four. And, and, and chapter four here is, you know, if you've noticed kind of the way this goes, it kind of breaks, and then you kind of see that it's broken, and then the whole thing falls apart, okay? And that's really what's going on in chapter four. So this is the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain, jealous of his brother, kills his brother, and, uh, and then this is verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Hmm. Does Cain know where his brother is? Yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's that place with all the blood. And, and, and even like later, it's like the you know the, the blood of your brother is crying out to me from the ground. Okay, that's what he's going to say. So, so here now, whose lie does that resemble? Who's already given us an outright lie? Serpent did from the very beginning. You'll surely not die. All right. It takes a generation and a half. Right? For them to get to, 
Hey, Kate, where's your brother? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't see him. He's probably around here someplace. No, it's not my responsibility to keep track of my brother. <laughs> Lies. Okay. But now, is, is this, so you're, we're looking at this as a foundation for ourselves, okay? For our world and how we understand it, okay? There were a couple of different ways that lies were happening, right? Some of them were intended to deceive, right? For the sake of benefiting us, benefiting us. So like, so the devil looked and saw, boy, wouldn't it be great if I could mess all of these things up, okay? Some of it is in defense of self, right? Uh, uh, something happened that was wrong. Something that, something that they did, something that we do is wrong. And now I'm going to lie in order to cover it up. Okay, and then, and then of course we saw it escalate uh, with, with Cain all the way to the point where it's an outright lie. I didn't do it. Um, Yes, and so and so ultimately, this is all a rebuke against God, and we'll, we're going to see that in a little bit. It's, it gets pretty clear when we get to to First uh, John, um, and so then and so then we we see the establishment of something that we are all very familiar with, right? And we're so familiar with it that we've all done it, okay? And this is this is where it gets really hard for us. Because we're all very, we're all, you know, we all have a certain amount of pride. You know, we don't like to admit it. It's kind of easy when we're in a great big group of people and I say, I've sinned. It's a little harder when it, and it gets, you know, personal. And we, we've all been there. We've all done it. Um, and so this, this is where we're going to share again. And, um, and I know this is not the easiest thing to do, but do your best, okay? Share a situation where you were caught being untruthful. Why'd you do it? Why did you choose to hide the truth? And what trust issues resulted from your untruthfulness? Because it's bound to happen, right? When we lie, people can't trust us. You cry wolf enough, and they're not going to come when the real wolf is there. So, uh, so try to open up. I know this is hard for us. Um, and, and if you're, if you're kind of wrestling in your heart a little bit, then you're probably understanding the question. Uh, so, uh, so go to it and, and have, have a little conversation around the table. Uh, think of times when you were caught being untruthful, why did you do it? And what are the trust issues that related to that? Go for it. All right, let's bring this back together. I know you're not done. I know you're not done. This is my problem. I, I love getting you talking. I do. I do. And there's a few more things I want to say. Um, and I'm gonna, I want to get you talking a couple more times here. Um, but what I, what I hope you found in your, in your conversations is that, uh, that when, when those lies happen and when they are found out, uh, trust really suffers. Okay, and when, when trust suffers, it, it makes it harder to do everything because you never, you never know when you're being lied to, okay? And that trust then needs to be built up again. I wanna take us to John chapter 18. And this is a, this is a very famous passage of scripture, um, but it really shows a contrast here. And the setting for this is uh, Jesus is, uh, has been arrested and handed over to the Roman authorities. And he is, uh, he is being, in a sense, interviewed or uh, arraigned by, uh, by Pilate himself, so the governor. And, um, and so Pilate is asking him some interesting questions. So this is John chapter 18, uh, beginning in verse 37. Then Pilate said to Jesus, So, you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, 
to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? All right, that's our, that's our passage here. Now, really interesting stuff, because you've got Jesus, God himself, who is the source of all truth, thinking back to creation, and a man, Pilate, who is in the midst of a world where he doesn't know if he can trust anyone. Okay, and if you think about the Roman world that they had, I mean, they didn't have nearly the kind of ability to communicate that we have, which just makes the tr truth crisis worse, right? Because you can get lies quicker to everyone. Um, but Rome was on a very similar trajectory as our current culture, too. So, so he didn't know, and he heard something. Is that really true? You've got to verify stuff. Okay. And here, in this situation, he's got these, he's got these wacky religious leaders who are like trotting out this this like itinerant preacher to him in the middle of their great big festival and he's just trying to keep the peace and here he's got this guy spouting stuff about kingdoms he doesn't see anything that he's done wrong and and he's just like i don't know who to believe and here, here you are saying everybody listens to you who have the truth and then i got these weirdo religious people and they want they think you should be killed and in the meantime, I'm trying to protect the city from these zealots who are going to try to, like, start a revolution. And then, ah, what is truth? Can, can, you, can you see him getting to that point where he's just, like, so overwhelmed with all these voices coming at him where he's just, I don't even know what truth is. That's where our world is right now. That's it. What is truth? But... We also, we don't, I mean, we can really latch on to those few words right there and say, yes, I understand that. But don't miss what Jesus said before that. I'm actually going to read it again. That why is he come into the world? To bear witness to the truth. What does the commandment say? Right? Don't give a false witness against your neighbor. What does Jesus say? I have come to bear witness to the truth. And then he said, everyone who is of the truth, it's an interesting phrase, of the truth, who belongs to the truth, listens to my voice. Okay? So if we're in a crisis of trust, and truth is hard to come by, what does Jesus say is the way for us to have the truth? That's right. And, and you got your answer right. We've got it right then. What would, what would Jesus, and in a lot of ways it's what would Jesus say, right? Because that's what he says. Listen to me. The people who are of the truth, listen to me. And that's why it's a Jesus counterculture. Because we're listening to Jesus. And we are putting our trust in him. And we are following according to his ways. We may not trust all the other people in the world. I hope we can, but it's just not a reality. Who can we trust? We can trust Jesus. And since this is the body of Jesus, the manifestation of him on the earth, guess who else we should be able to trust? Each other. Okay, so what I, what I want you to do for just a few minutes around the tables is this. Compare and contrast the issue of trust with our broader culture and with the Jesus counterculture. And just, just take a few minutes here and go back and forth. What is the broader culture doing that with, with trust and what is the difference with us? How are we different than the culture? Go. All right, this is a conversation that, uh, we, another one that we can keep on going and going and going, right? Because the difference between the broader culture when it comes to trust and the church when it comes to trust 
it, it ought to be a, a really strong contrast, right? And I say ought to be because uh, we're a bunch of sinners and we, we can sometimes break trust with one another as well. And, uh, and that's an easy thing to do. What I want to do next is uh, I want to set out a bit of a vision for the Jesus counterculture. Uh, what does it look like to, to be a, a, a gathering of people who are trustworthy, who are uh, being honest with one another? And there, there are two passages of scripture that I think are going to really help us with that. The first one is in 1 John. And uh, you ought to find it uh, something to recognize when we get to it. So this is 1 John chapter 1, and we'll do 8 to 10 here. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Okay, powerful words from John here. Uh, there's a reason why we say that. Off, you know, the beginning of our divine service one, right? Whenever we do that one, uh, these are the words that we say before we confess, and there's a good reason for it. Because if we deny that we have sin, who are we lying to? We're lying to ourselves. Okay. And this really is, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is the, at the core of Christianity. Because if I'm lying to myself, am I going to change my behavior? No. No, I'm going to end up doing the same thing I have been doing. And chances are, the thing that I've been doing isn't working. Okay? So, Jesus, when he comes onto the scene, the very first word he says is, repent. Well, what does it take to repent? You got to admit you're going the wrong way. If I say I don't have sin, I'm still going that way. All right. So really, all John is saying is he's repeating what Jesus said. When Jesus said repent, he was essentially saying admit that you're wrong, and start going the other way. Okay. Same same message. It is the exact same message. All right. But there's something else here. Okay. And that's verse ten. If we say we have not sinned, who else do we make a liar? God. Who else said that God was lying? The serpent. The serpent. So, that's some interesting company. <laughs> right? I mean, let's, let's just be, seriously, if, if we're going to be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pure, I'm great, I'm, you know, I've done all the right things. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then and then there's God looking upon us and just being like, oh no. Oh no, no you're not. No you're not. We really have to be honest with ourselves. And this is core to the Jesus counterculture. We are honest with the fact that we are broken and sinful people. We cannot save ourselves. And the first step is to be honest with ourselves before we get to anybody else. And trust me, God does want us to get to everyone else. We have to be honest with ourselves, right? Jesus' parable, you know, take the log out of your own eye before you try and reach for the speck in the other brother's eye. You're still reaching for specks, trust me. The speck in an eye hurts really a lot. Yeah. But you gotta get the log out of your eye first, okay? That's what we're talking about here. We need to be honest with ourselves, honest with God. Okay, and that on and when we do that, when we do that, people will start to trust us. It's an amazing thing what happens when you go and you are authentically like, yeah, you know what? I make a lot of mistakes, and I'm really honest. About, I I I don't want you to know that I'm going to make some mistakes, and I'm going to apologize for those mistakes. I'm going to do my best best to rectify those mistakes, and I know who gives me forgiveness for those mistakes. You build a lot of trust in people when you are honest about yourself. Okay, so that's that's number one. Second one, go to Matthew five. This is this is Matthew five, beginning in verse thirty-three. I'll read it again. You have heard that it was said of those of old, "You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn." But I say to you, 
do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no, and just let it be. All right? So remember, the first step was be, be honest with yourself, be honest with God. But then the next one is just be honest with other people. Okay? If it's yes, then it's yes. And let the chips fall where they may. If it's no, it's no. Let the chips fall where they may. Okay? And that's that's really hard for us because we like to spin stuff, right? We want to make it the outcome be something that we want it to be rather than just letting it be what it is and be honest. And, and usually, if it's something bad, it should come with, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not, you know, I did it and I meant it. It was awful, right? No, we, we, it's... it's it's just, an, it's just an honesty that just lets, lets it, and you know what? At the end of the day, it's going to be God who sorts all this out anyway, right? Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So God is going to be the ultimate judge in all of this. But if, if we can be people who are letting our yes be yes, and we can be people who are letting our no be no, then maybe, just maybe, we can have reconciliation here on earth. And that's the preferred future for us, Right? Even if it's a really hard thing. That's what God wants us to have. And that's why he wants our yes to be yes. And that's why he wants our no to be no. Because we, as his counterculture, know how to do this thing called reconciliation. Where we can listen to each other and love each other and forgive each other. And let me tell you, that's countercultural. No one else is doing that. Okay. But it doesn't happen if we're not honest. It just doesn't. Otherwise, we're just all lying to each other. And what good is that? So, so this gets us to our final thing. And once again, look at me. I'm just way over. Um, but that was my fault because I talked too long this morning. Um, so if you have time to talk a little bit more, um, what, I want, what I want to say here is, is that we, when we tell the truth, sometimes we can be really insensitive. <laughs> and we don't want that. We don't want insensitive truths, right? The idea is that we're speaking the truth in love, right? So we want to hold to the truth 100%, but we also want to be completely committed to the benefit of other people, all right? And we want to do both of those at the same time. And that's tricky. So you don't compromise on the truth in order to love people, but you don't compromise on loving people in order to tell them the truth, which means you've got a narrow way to walk on. And that's, if you have time to stick around and talk about it, that's the thing to discuss. And that's the thing to really ponder in your heart. How can we love people and tell them the truth at the same time? All right? I want to pray about it, and then you can talk about it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, uh, we thank you for being the source of all truth. And we thank you for being God of heaven and earth. And we thank you that we can trust in you. And, and Lord, we pray that we might be continually remade into your image. That that we can be trustworthy people, that the words out of our mouth can, can create images and realities that are consistent with the one you made, not, not whatever we want them to think. And, and so, Lord, we pray that you might engage us into a counterculture, a different way of life that is, that is just fundamentally different than our world. Teach us to be trustworthy people. Teach us to love everyone and to how to speak that truth in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.